planes, trains and automobiles. Now, if we leave out the bit about the automobiles, we've seen a few variations on how trains have been powered, from steam to diesel and now electric. But there was a time when several experimental trains used engines from planes as their main propulsion. So this is a look at the very rare and futuristic aero trains and why, to excuse the pun, they didn't take off. This video is sponsored by Magellan TV. Now, Magellan is a new documentary streaming service run by filmmakers that have a passion for their work. They believe that science defines the cutting edge of society and that their mission is to tell great stories that define the human struggle to discover more. Magellan now has over 3,000 documentaries available, with more being added each week, and with a wide selection of those being in 4K for no extra cost. And you can also stream them directly to your smartphone or tablet wherever you are. There's a great documentary called Trains, Rockets and Pains, which is part of the Disasters in Space series, which looks at the behind the scenes stories of NASA catastrophes and near misses, many of which are unknown to the public and also to me, and have proved really rather eye-opening and well worth watching. You can watch this and many more by getting your one month free trial by using the link for this special offer right at the top of the description below, and I'm sure you'll find Magellan TV as worthwhile as I have. Now look at these two trains. The one on the left is the original Japanese Shinkansen Zero series, aka the Bullet Train which entered service in 1964 with a top speed of 130 miles an hour, or 210 kilometers an hour. So you ask, well, what is the one on the right? Well, that is the German Scheinen Zeppelin, or Rail Zeppelin, that debuted in 1930 with a top speed of 143 miles an hour, or 230 kilometers an hour, 34 years before the Shinkansen. But of course, there is also something majorly different between them besides the 34 year age gap. If we pull the picture out, you'll see that not only is the Shine and Zeppelin just a single rail car, but it's also powered by a propeller and an aero engine on the back. Now, this wasn't the first attempt to power a train with a propeller. In 1917, the Soviet engineer Valerian Abakovsky created the Aero Wagon, an experimental high-speed rail car powered by an aero engine and propeller. This could travel up to 87 miles per hour or 140 kilometers per hour and was designed to carry Soviet officials. However, in 1921, things didn't go too well for it. After a successful test run from Moscow to Tula with several foreign delegates on board, the Aero Wagon was on the return journey back to Moscow when it was derailed at high speed killing seven of the 22 people on board, including its creator, Abakovsky, putting a rather abrupt stop to the project, which was canceled shortly afterwards. The idea was then taken up eight years later in 1930 by the German aero engineer, Franz Kruckenberg, when he created the Scheinen Zeppelin for the German Imperial Railway Company, the Deutsche Reichsbahn. Kruckenberg was inspired by the aerodynamics of the then current Zeppelin airships, and the Scheinen Zeppelin was constructed with a lightweight aluminium aircraft style body to reduce its weight to just 20 tons. For just over 25 meters long, the rail car ran on two axles, and the power came from two conjoined BMW 4 six cylinder aircraft engine driving a four braided propeller, though later this would be changed for a single 600 horsepower 46 liter BMW 6 V12 aero engine driving a two bladed prop which was tilted down by seven degrees to provide some downforce. In the interior, there was room for 40 passengers on board, which was done in a rather minimalist Bauhaus style. On June 21st, 1931, on the Berlin-Hamburg line, the Scheinen Zeppelin set a new world speed record for the fastest rail car at 143 miles an hour or 240 kilometers, which stood for 23 years until it was broken again in 1954, and it still holds a speed record for the fastest petrol-powered rail vehicle. Now, as a concept, it looks good on paper, but it doesn't take long to see the major flaws. The most obvious thing was the large open propeller spinning at high speed 
that would be just a couple of metres away from people on a train platform as it pulled into and out of a station. The noise and thrust it generated would also kick up anything that wasn't fixed down. Dust, rubbish, signs and track ballast. Going backwards was dangerous because of the open prop and it couldn't easily tow carriages, again, because of the prop. It also had trouble going up steep inclines as the airflow separated when full power was applied. And just to add the cherry on top of the cake, the standard rail lines themselves were just not up to the demands of sustained high-speed travel. So after the record-breaking run, it was modified, the propeller was removed, and a hydraulic drive was fitted to a new powered front bogey, but this lowered the top speed to 110 miles an hour, or 180 kilometers per hour. However, by 1932, the Deutsche Reichsbahn had gone off without Krukenberg and developed their own new streamlined two-car train set, which became known as the Hamburg Flyer, or the Flying Hamburger, which became the first fast diesel electric train in Germany. The Schein and Zeppelin fared less well, and with competition from the Deutsche Reichsbahn and other high-speed efforts, it was eventually scrapped in 1939 to supply metal for the war effort. But it wasn't forgotten. The lightweight streamlined design was years ahead of anything else and would influence high-speed train design decades after the Schein and Zeppelin had been scrapped. Now you may have thought that after the Schein and Zeppelin, trains powered by aircraft engines wouldn't have made it past the design brief, let alone into construction, but that didn't stop the Americans from having a go, but this time with a jet-powered rail car. The idea came from the tech centre of the New York Central Railroad to see if they could develop a high-speed train for city-to-city -city use. Using jet engines was the cheapest and easiest way to gain the 10,000 horsepower required. The idea was presented to Alfred Perlman, the president of the New York Central in 1965, and discussed, but then shelved. Then, about a year later, the director of the tech centre, Jim Wright, got a phone call from Perlman saying the project had been given the go-ahead, but it had to be done in 30 days. And to make it happen, he was effectively given a blank check to use whatever resources within the company to get it done. They started with a 13-year-old Bud RDC-3 self-propelled rail car, number M497. The engines were disconnected from the wheels, several rows of seats were removed for the jet mounting structure, new jet fuel tanks were fabricated and fitted, and over 50 different instruments were installed to measure stress, temperature, vibrations, etc., to turn it into a rolling laboratory. The engines were a pair of surplus GE J4719s, plus their mounting pod, which would have originally been used as boosters for the B-36 Peacemaker nuclear bombers. The engines and pod were mounted upside down on the front of a rail car and inclined four degrees downwards to give greater downforce. Then finally a fairing which had been wind tunnel tested was added to the front and the dark paint job gained it the name of a black beetle by the press. Don Wetzel, Jim Wright's assistant and the project manager was chosen to pilot the train because he was not only a qualified locomotive engineer but also had been a pilot in the Marine Corps and was familiar with jet engines. The test run was to be done over a weekend on the 23rd and 4th of July 1966 on a section of track between Butler, Indiana and Airlane Junction, Ohio, where the track was straight and there was a four mile section of continuously welded rail. Over the two days, various runs were done, culminating at a top speed of 183.85 miles an hour or 295.85 kilometers per hour. Though Don said that on that run, it had gotten away from him and it actually hit over 190 miles an hour and he was actually decelerating through the timing gate. Although it was just a concept, it was seriously looked at to power future trains, but modifying all the automatic signals to work at over double the 90 mile an hour limit they used at the time, together with the problem of low bridges, noise, debris and ballast thrown up by the jets, meant much more money would be required to ready the track and station infrastructure than just creating the jet rail cars themselves. There was also the issue that under 300 miles an hour or 480 kilometers an hour, the jet engines themselves were very inefficient and used far more fuel than a standard rail car. After the tests, the rail car was converted back to a normal rail car 
and went back to working the commuter lines until 1977 when it was retired and sat in sidings until it was finally scrapped in 1984. Meanwhile, in 1970 in the Soviet Union, an experiment studying wheel pairs and bogies at speeds above 160 km per hour required the building of a laboratory railcar. To remove the influence of the wheels being driven, the power would come from a pair of jet engines mounted to the roof similar to that of the US Black Beetle. A traction car from an ER-22 electric train was converted with a pair of AI-25 jet engines from a Yak-40 passenger plane. Originally it was due to use the RD-45 engines from a MiG-15 fighter, but at 900 kilograms each they were too heavy, so they switched to the lighter 400 kilogram AI-25s. Fairings were added to the front and rear and the wheels at the side were covered. During the wind tunnel tests, 15 variations were tried with the best one achieving a drag factor of 0.252, as good as many high-speed sports cars of the time. Test started in 1971 and in 1972 it reached a top speed of 249 kilometers or 154 miles an hour. The program ran until 1975 with results used to build the experimental RT200 high-speed passenger cars and the ER200 high-speed electric train. Again, like in the US, the possibility of using jet-powered trains was considered, but along with the similar issues that the Americans found, the Soviets thought that the stations and tracks would need to be built like airports and away from residential areas because of the noise. After the tests were complete, the jet rail car was left to rot in sidings for many years. It was going to be moved to the railway museum in St. Petersburg, but it was in such a poor state of repair that just the front of the rail car with the engine pods was cut off, renovated and placed outside the TVZ carriage works where it was originally built. With the advances of electric trains in the 1980s and beyond, the idea of jet trains was dropped because it was just not economically viable to build the infrastructure to support them and to put up with all the issues of noise and jet blast they produced. So I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did, don't forget to please thumbs up, subscribe, click the bell and share. And before I go, I'd just like to thank all of our patrons for their ongoing support.